get a million dollar contract. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I didn't get you to sign any kind of a disclosure form, so I guess the default is I just own it all. Okay, so thank you again, Professor Levine. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, already a technical problem. Okay. Yeah, when I uh, uh, started working on things, first of all, thank you for letting me give a computer science lecture at the math department. Uh, it's, you know, Authors always want to promote their latest book. You know, musicians are always pushing their newest album, so I want to, you know, talk about what I've been working on the last six months, as opposed to, you know, digging up something that I haven't, you know, looked at for a year. Um, as I was uh, developing this lecture, I decided to add a little more at the beginning about high-performance computing in general, and then move because really, cluster computing is high-performance computing. Why would you bother? using a cluster computer if you could do it effectively on one computer, right? So I'm going to talk, talk a little bit about uh, high performance techniques at the beginning and then move on to the work I've been doing with uh, the clusters uh, with GNU Herd. So this is the, uh, the top ten uh, the most powerful computers in the world, uh, supposedly, the, you know, publicly acknowledged, you know, the uh, the aliens at their secret base at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean may have a quantum computer, but uh, as far as is publicly known, these are the ten most, you know, powerful supercomputers in the world. And probably there are two or three more that could be added to the list. NSA locally, or, and would be at the very top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, what, do, what, what do I find interesting about this list? I mean, first of all, let's look at the the processors that are used. This thing is um, Sunway at the top. It's a Chinese developed RISC architecture. But after that, it's Intel, Intel, Intel. Opteron is AMD. This thing, IBM A2, it's their power architecture. Intel, 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 and Spark. So seven out of the 10 are, you know, 86 <coughs> type processors. A, dramatic contrast from what it was uh, 25 years ago when people had, you know, you, you build a supercomputer, you can do specialty chips. Now it's, you know, high-end stuff. These aren't, you know, laptop chips, but these are, you know, stuff you could probably just, you know, go online and, and you know, buy a, a server with, um, you know, one of these Xeon chips. The operating system, Linux, 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 all the way through, all running Linux. So the Current generation, what's that? Yes, Michael. It just it, it flipped on. Yeah, I think it might be the cable. Away from it, it turns goes off. Yeah, it's it's like a quantum mechanics effect. I have to keep observing it, perhaps, for it to stay on. Um, so it's all Linux, and again, this is a kind of a dramatic shift in the last twenty-five years. That the current generation of supercomputers. Yes, ma'am. What does course mean? Because you have 19 million in number four versus 10 million in number one. Well, um, that's simply the, you know, it's, it's the, the number of processor cores. So you have more processors in the one ranked number four. These are the reported numbers. I certainly haven't gathered them the data myself. This is from uh, this website, so top 500. The, the cores are not as powerful. The so the processor is not that powerful. Um, the 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 ranking ranking yeah, notice oh, probably teraflops. I'm guessing. That, that kind of, what's that? The operations per. I'm I'm thinking. Teraflops. Seven point so operations per second. Okay. I'm I'm guessing that that's yeah. how it's ranked. Um, notice here is a coprocessor. The NVIDIA. It, it's a Intel processor. Number three one here. The Intel main processor. It's also got a, an NVIDIA coprocessor. That coprocessor has a lot of power, too. So that might be 361,000 of the Intel Xeon cores, and then each one might have a nice coprocessor attached to it. So that's possibly why um, this one has you know, a lot less cores than the ones around it. That, that would be my guess, but I don't know because it's just you know, the reported data on, on the website. But that's certainly a good question. Um, and you certainly see the, the number of cores, 10 million, 3 million. You know, small one, 361,000, 19 million, half a million, one million and a half. Uh, the current generation of supercomputers is that they are built using commodity chips, high-end stuff, but commodity chips 
commodity operating systems, and then we're going to take, you know, thousands of these things, rack upon rack upon rack upon rack, and tie them all together, and this is how we're going to build a supercomputer. So cluster, computer, cluster computing has become dominant at the highest end of uh, supercomputing, and uh, also, you know, it's, it's used uh, at more modest workloads as well. Here's another look at the top 500. This is by time, this is over the last 25 years, how that list has evolved, how the processor family has evolved. This is Cray. This chunk here is Cray. You can see they had the biggest chunk 25 years ago. And that's dwindled down to next to nothing. And the big winner has been Intel, and, A and uh, this is AMD. You know, that 86 processor family has just come to dominate supercomputing. Does this mean the number, number of systems, the number of customers or something? The number of I think it's the number of 500, you know, out of the 500, whatever's on the top 500 list, how many of them are AMDs? How many of them are oh, okay. Intels? How many of them are Cray's? Top 500 teraflops. Right. Top 500 computers. Yeah. You know, ranked probably by flops, teraflops. But Cray still has um, several, quite a few in the top, uh, top 10. Well, they actually, if we go back to this list, they actually built one of them. Where is it? Two of them. Three of them. Oh, here. Yeah, yeah. Cray, 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 Cray. Four of them were built by Cray, mm -hmm. but Xeon, Xeon, Opteron, Xeon. They're using Intel and AMD processors. Well, 25 years ago, they were building their own chips. I think. They certainly had, I, think, I think they were building their own chips. They had, they had custom processors. I think they were building themselves. No quantum computer on the list? Not yet. There's one from, the, Not yet. from Canada. I can't remember the name of the company. Oh, yes. That uh, has machines that mm -hmm. are run by Microsoft and a couple mm -hmm. of very big players. Yeah, I can't, th I, I think I know what you're talking about. Um. Russia and China probably have some secrets as well as the yeah. USA. So, what kind of techniques do we have to exploit parallelism? He said partially. What I'm going to talk about are the, the superscalar vector mm -hmm. operations, multiple cores, thread level parallelism, the coprocessors as I've already mentioned, and then cluster computers node level parallelism. Um, instruction level parallelism, uh, basically the stuff that the Cray was doing 25 years ago has become mainstream. You know, this laptop has, um, it, its arithmetic logic unit is naturally 256 bits wide. It can handle four 64-bit integers simultaneously. So how do we take advantage of that? I mean, here's an example, just some simple C code that adds 512 64-bit integers. So it runs a loop, and here's the, the code that gets generated at a modest level of optimization. Um, just move, add, you know, add, uh, in increment your uh, register address, your, uh, your memory address by four, move the result back out to memory, check to see if you reach the limit, the 512 limit, and if not, jump and just loop over this 512 times. That's at the uh, O2, optimization level 2 of GCC. If we increase GCC's optimization level to the highest level, O3, this is what we get now. Now we're starting to use these XMM registers. Intel, as time went on, just started making its registers bigger and bigger and bigger. So an XMM is, uh, I see it can hold, I believe, four, I want to say it can hold four 64-bit integers, that sounds, 16 bits, 16 bytes, that sounds, yeah, that's right, 16 bytes. So the XMM is a 16-byte register that can hold, yeah, four, four-byte 64-bit integers, and then it can add them in parallel the p add add, p add d double word, it's a parallel add. So as well, this loop, the previous slide, it incremented this register by four, the memory pointer by four each time through the loop. Now what we're doing is four adds in parallel and we're incrementing by 16 every time through the loop. So this loop only runs 128 times. 
we can increase the optimization even further by adding the switch arch equals native. What this does is it tells the compiler now to optimize for whatever processor it's running on. Uh, this code might not run on a different processor that doesn't have the AVX2 instruction set. But this particular laptop does have AVX2. So if you add arch native, it will look and say, oh, it can do AVX2. So it's got YMM registers. Those are 32-byte registers. Now it can load and it can do 32 bytes. So that's eight ads at a time. It's going to do eight of these ads in parallel. Now we have a VP add instruction different instruction, vector parallel add, and it's going to loop 64 times each time through the loop doing 16 adds in parallel. Did have to add this attribute align 32. We're starting to get to a point where uh, you want your arrays to be nicely aligned on memory addresses in order to make these, these move instructions work nicely. We can increase the optimization further. I tell it to use the, the latest and greatest, the AVX512 superscalar instructions. Now it's using ZMM registers. So these are 64 byte wide instruction uh, registers. So it's loading 64 bytes at a time, doing a parallel add of you know 16 of these adds all at once. I mean it has enough transistors, the chip is built, so we could just do 16 ads simultaneously. And then we increment by 64, and this entire loop only has to run then, uh, what is that? One, 64, 128, 256, 512, eight times. The whole, is that right? That's not quite right. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's uh, 32 times. 32 times. It runs 32 times um, computing, d doing 16 ads simultaneously. Uh, the problem with this is that it doesn't run on my laptop. I'm now telling it to you know, run with an instruction set the laptop doesn't have, so I get an illegal instruction exception and uh, the core gets stopped. So we have, the, the, these are the techniques that Cray pioneered 25 years ago. And they've now become mainstream. We're seeing them in our you know, just ordinary laptop processors. Pointer aliasing is, um, OK, so what happens if we're trying to you know, write our code to do this? You know, We don't want to write an operation that passes in integer, 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 and just adds A plus B and saves it in C. What we want to do is we want to write our functions so that they operate on 16 integers at a time. So we pass in a pointer to a 16 element array, and a pointer to another 16 element array, and a pointer to another 16 element array. And then what the program does is it runs a little loop you know, over 0 to 15 and adds them all up. And we expect that this is going to get optimized into a you know, vector operation, 16 ads simultaneously. So let's say we do this. Let's say we set up now an 18 element vector that starts with two ones and the rest are all zeros. And we call this operation, and I pass it for A, the address of the first element, for B, the address of the second element, and for C, the address of the third element. And then my question is, what does this code do? Uh, I'll give you a hint. This is you want a math lecture. This is the math component of the lecture. So what do you think? We do it 18 times, whatever it is. Well, we actually just, we do it 16 times. The, the, the loop runs. So this is just printing it out. All this does is a print out. The real question is what, the, what does this operation do? What does this do? We call it with... Uh, 18 elements in an array, and we pass it the addresses of the first, and second, and third three element. Of them, three of the elements. What's that? X plus Y plus Z, or X, Y, and Z are vectors. Yeah. So it loops over the thing, and it adds. What's that? So it adds. Yeah. 
Fibonacci series. The exactly, Rob. That's exactly. This code computes the Fibonacci series. This code that makes the the second element equal to the uh, the third one sets equal to the second one plus the first one. And then it sets the fourth one equal to the third one plus the second one. And then the fifth one equal to the fourth one plus the third one. And so on. And actually, yeah, it computes the Fibonacci series sequence. Um, that's not quite what we wanted to do with this code. You know, you can't compute the Fibonacci uh, sequence by doing, you know, 16 adds in parallel. You know, the problem is that the compiler when it compiles this code has no way of knowing that you're not calling it like this. The compiler can't just trivially, trivially parallelize this loop. There's basically three ways to handle this problem. One way is you just loop 16 times. Second way, if you turn on GCC at its highest level of optimization, O3, it'll probably spit out about a thou I'm sorry, about 100 instructions for this uh, function. It will test the pointers to see if this case is met. If so, do this loop. Otherwise, do the vector parallelized add. It will have two branches of this function. The third way is to use the restrict keyword, which was introduced to the C standard in 1999. And that is a declaration to the compiler that what we saw on the previous slide cannot happen. You're assuring the machine that when it generates this code, these pointers do not overlap. You can parallelize it. And now, when you compile the thing, you get what you expected. Load 64 bytes, add them all, 16 elements in parallel, save them back out, return. Once you want to move on to a multi-core code, you know, you have a dual core processor here. Um, four core processors, 16 kind of common on you know, server architectures. Now you need to do this, this threading thing where you figure out how to allocate your, uh, your array across, in this case, three different threads. So we compute starting indices. Then we um, fire off uh, three different threads, passing each one of them you know, a different you know, starting point in the index. And then when we're done, we have to synchronize them. We wait for all the threads to complete execution. So this is the kind of code you would write if you want the thing now to fan out across multiple cores on your processor and then collect all the results at the end. This is a diagram of the Intel Ivy Bridge processor. Four cores, but uh, what I want to point out is the size of the graphics coprocessor. These coprocessors now are quite big. I mean, this thing core, you have like another one and another one and maybe a third one here. I got coprocessor is the size of two or three of your processor cores. You got a lot of computing power available here on your coprocessor. And the coprocessors have become more and more powerful. They started off just, you know, uh, doing a whole bunch of operations in parallel so you can have your nice interactive, you know, first person shooter games, everything looks nicely shaded as you're, you know, moving through the simulated town. Uh, but really what you're doing, you do a whole bunch of similar operations in parallel and what, you know, people realize in the high performance computing environment that the same graphics techniques can be used for other types of calculations as well. So this is, uh, common OpenCL. It's um, yeah, probably the standard, probably, you know, it's an open standard for programming coprocessors. Uh, OpenGL is the open standard for graphics programming. OpenCL is doing, you know, compute processing. So this is a, a device query on this laptop, an Intel Core i5. Uh, compute units 20. This thing's got 20 cores. They're not as sophisticated as a, um, uh, you know, the Intel 86 core. It's a completely different instruction set. But you got, you know, 20 cores here, you know, if you want to use them. And if you look at the preferred vector width of these different instructions, 
long is a 64-bit integer, and it says preferred vector width is 2, so it looks like it can do, you know, dual operations on 64-bit integers simultaneously. So suggests this, I, I don't know coprocessors that well, but what this output suggests to me is you got 20, you know, compute units, cores, that are each capable of handling two 64-bit integers simultaneously. So how do you take advantage of this? Well, you write code in a different language, really, OpenCL. It's uh, essentially C, but you've got some other stuff. You've got this kernel keyword, global, you have both global memory and local memory. Uh, what this function does is it gets the global ID of what core it's running on, the global size of how many these process cores are running simultaneously. Based on this, figures out where to start and stop in the array, and then goes ahead and adds up those numbers. What you need to do is you need to take this thing, compile it, and load it onto your coprocessor array. So this is what your main code looks like to do this. Here's um, three arrays, or three 512 element integer arrays again. Now we essentially compile the program at runtime, uh, create a bunch of buffers on the device, uh, create a command queue. This takes the buffers, the, the arrays in memory, and writes them out to the coprocessor. <laughs> now we set the arguments on the program, and we go ahead and run it in queue in the range kernel. This is what actually pushes the uh, the program out to the coprocessor tells that we want to uh, fan out across 20 compute units and then when we're done we read the results back into array C. So, the, the point I'm trying to make in the last 20 minutes or so is this. If you want to just, you know, if you have a, a high performance application, uh, just writing your code so that you can take advantage of the computing resources you have on a single computer is not trivial. Um, what kind of, you know, modify your code. You know, short little for loops that can be par vector parallelized by the uh, compiler. Uh, the, uh, the synchronization stuff you gotta throw in if you're doing thread level parallelism. If you're working on a coprocessor, you probably have to use a, a entirely different language in this you know, library that can you know, push buffers out to the coprocessor, run code there, pull it back. But uh, you know, if you want like, just like this laptop here, dual core, you know, and it's got 20 more processor cores out on the coprocessor, to take advantage of that, you pretty much have to you know, do all of this. But high performance computing is a, a bit of a rabbit hole in the sense that, you know, you're always digging deeper and the, the tunnel just keeps going. You know, if you've optimized this stuff so that you can analyze um, a chess end game with six pieces, then it's like, okay, now I want to analyze one with seven pieces. If you've uh, analyzed a, um, a filter on a microwave circuit that, uh, you know, filters out your high frequency signal and keeps it from bleeding back into your power supply, like, okay, now I want to analyze an entire radar module. You know, you always have, you know, a larger application, and once you've, you know, kind of run out of computing resources on one computer, then the question is, okay, how can, how can you move into a cluster environment and exploit multiple computers? So this is um, the, the primary development system that I'm using for, uh, for HERD. It's a Cisco 5108 blade server with eight of uh, these B200s. Each one of these slots here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, each one of these is a computer. Each one of these has uh, 12 cores and 96 gigabytes of RAM. So each one of these little things is it's certainly more powerful than my laptop. I dare say more la powerful than you know, most you know, computers that any of us would use on a daily basis. And then we've got eight of them, eight of them all together. So how do we 
you know, exploit all 96 cores and 768 gigabytes of RAM. You, uh, you know, it's certainly not on the top 500 list. It's not on the top 500,000 list, but this is, you know, a reasonable platform for doing, you know, these modest high performance applications. And the question is, how do we tie them all together and exploit the, the cluster parallelism of this machine? So um, partial history of cluster computing. VMS is probably the most successful cluster um, operating system. Uh, VAX is, you know, DEC developed VMS for VAX. You could uh, put VM, VAX, you know, VAX machines together in a cluster, and you would log into the cluster, and you would do your operations cluster-wide. Um, and it's still around. They still have, they have like an open VMS or something. I really haven't used it at all. I remember back in college, we had some VMS machines I logged into once or something, but I really just don't know <coughs> VMS. But certainly it's very successful. Beowulf clusters were initially developed back in the 90s at NASA. Basically, you know, just commodity PCs running something like Linux. Um, and the primary uh, tools you're using there are what's called MPI. PVM seems to have passed a bit into the wayside, but MPI, the message passing interface, um, that's still around. It's a library that you can link against that, you know, lets you, you know, provides you a lot of low-level primitives for internode communications in a cluster environment. Um, the problem, see, the, you can criticize all of this stuff, but uh, the difference here between this, Hadoop is probably uh, the most successful right now. It's a Java-based solution. And, you know, Java is very popular. Java, I mean, Hadoop is relatively simple. I think that's one of the reasons Hadoop is so popular is because it is, it's based on Java. I mean, how hard is it to install? You, you don't have to modify the kernel or anything. How hard is it to install Java SSH? I mean, that's, that's what it takes to build a Hadoop cluster. So um, that's become very popular. And then what I'm looking at is the idea of a single system image. All of these things, Beowulf, Hadoop, um, they require you to modify your code to program against their particular API. And I have a slide here on a, this is a Hadoop example. Hadoop is based on this uh, idea of map reduce, that you, you have a bunch of map operations that are run in parallel, and then you have a reduce operation that gathers all the results from those map operations and, you know, collects them together. And you write it in Java, and then your Java code can push all these, uh, these programs out to a, you know, a Java-based Hadoop cluster and run them. Um, kind of the main thing I want to, like, note on this is that, uh, you know, what are we doing here? There's a lot of Hadoop-specific <coughs> stuff, you know, a mapper, int writable, um, you know, you have to uh, contact, you, you write out these key value pairs, and then the reducer, you know, again, you're pulling in these things called int writables. This is not, I mean, it's a Java, but it's, a, it's a, a specialty API. You have to take your code and maybe port it to Java if it's not written in Java, and then you have to, you know, port it to the, the Hadoop API. A lot of people know Java, a lot of people use Java, it's very popular, but it is not transparent the way a single system image would be. A single system image is a cluster of machines that appears to be one single system, so you don't have to uh, you know, do anything special to your code, presumably, in order to uh, get it to run in a cluster. Uh, as we've seen with some of the examples you know, earlier that uh, maybe you do have to, you, you always seem to have to modify your code. Let's say you get to make minimal changes to your code to run in a cluster if it all appears to be a single system. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. So when you say single system, mm -hmm. why is the structure of the cycle? Are they talking about just the minimal, is it connected, what they mean, or does it have to have a structure like this? No, that's just uh, a graphic. It doesn't have to have a structure. I mean, what, okay, for example, the one I had up on the screen, the Cisco, I mean, really that structure would be um, eight 
nodes, and they're all interconnected with a high-speed switching. They all connect to a switch, 40 megabit per second switch. So it'd be, it'd be a star topology with a you know, cut-through switch, high-speed switch in the middle, eight nodes out around it, and um, you know, the this, this switch can you know, switch packets, Ethernet packets round at 40 megabits per second. That's, that's the kind of topology you're more typically looking Would yeah. you care that there was a switch? I mean, transparently, it would be as if you have a graph and you have the processes are here, it's a cycle, but you were saying it could be a K8 it's graph. It's a star. It's a star. What but, st but I think the star is an implementation of K8. Yeah. So yeah. that rather than having separate wires right. or some linkage, you go to the star with switches, but conceptually, it's a it's a K eight, I think, rather than a star. Well, actually, I wanted to and modify. Like that. I wanted to modify this graphic to make it more accurately reflect the topology of the system, but I just it didn't seem like that big. It just you know a simple little graphic, but yeah, and, you know, it, it makes a difference. Um, you know, if you had a topology like this, it could slow things down. If you're you know, going around like this, but you know, typically. Um, Star topologies have become very popular. Um, that you know, e even even just um, in office environments, you know, I mean, typically you have a, a a cable there that goes right back to a switch. You have one switch in the closet, and then you have individual cables going out to all your PCs. Rather than 25 years ago, you had this coaxial cable running around, and they were all they were all ganged off of you know one bus. You know, buses are relatively slow because they're shared. You know, star topology, each link is, you know, dedicated to one host, so they tend to be faster. Mike, you have a question? Well, there's got to be a catch somewhere. In other words, it appears to be a single system, but there must be limitations. Mm -hmm. Of course. Of, of course. Yeah, of course. So, can you mention some of the limitations? Um, any kind of internode operation is going to be relatively slow. You know, compared to, you know, if I'm working on just one node, it's going to be fast. But if I got to do something over here, it's going to be relatively slow. So let's say I have, you know, shared memory. It's not really shared memory because the memory is completely distinct. But that's one of the major, you know, targets you have to hit here is how do you do distributed shared memory? Oh, it's sort of like virtual memory. Yeah, virtual memory, but it appears but it's all shared around these nodes. They all share virtual memory. Okay, that's nice. You can do that. Um, the problem is that if I'm working on a piece of memory and then another node Nick wants to go work on the same piece of memory, there has to be a handshaking operation there. It's a big cache coherency protocol. The memory gets copied over the network between the two nodes. This all takes time. So it is actually best, to, in an environment like this, to need to know what your cache size is, how, how big your cache lines are. Um, on a standard processor, they're like 64 bytes. On a cluster computer, it's going to be like 4 kilobytes. That's, it's going to be a virtual memory page. You want to stay off of other threads, other tasks, virtual memory pages. So you want to organize your code so that I'm working on a four kilobyte page, and the other thread, it's working on a separate four kilobyte page, and we don't touch each other's pages because as soon as I get into someone else's four kilobyte space, then the whole thing has to stop, transfer that page over, do the operations, transfer it back. So you do end up having to, you know, modify your code and change it and start thinking about, um, you know, how big are my pages? and try to keep uh, operations localized on virtual memory pages as much as possible. Um, if you don't do it, it'll still run. It's just going to be a lot slower. Okay, so these are some of the features that you know, we're looking for in, uh, if we're trying to build a single system image. A cluster, you log in to the entire cluster, you don't log into one computer. You see a single process space. You see all the processes in the cluster running together. Maybe process migration. I say maybe because systems have been developed to do this, but I mean certainly I can't do process migration now with herd. You know I can you know barely do you know whatever um, inter process communication with it really. So uh, it's not a uh, we can do some of this 
but not all. You, you, not all systems necessarily can do all of this. But we like to be able to do process migration, move processes between nodes transparently. We have, you see a single file system, maybe a redundant file system, maybe the, you know, uh, files are stored on multiple nodes so that if one fails, we can just fall back on another one. You know, we see a single I.O. space. I see, you know, I log in and I see, you know, 30 SCSI drives that are spread out all over my entire cluster, but I can kind of get to them all at once. Single inner process space, shared memory, semaphores, pipes, all of that, you know, is shared so you can just use your standard programming tools. That's the advantage, familiar programming and management tools. You don't need to write open CL code. You might have to write open CL code if you've got coprocessors you want to use. But the idea being you can just write standard C code, standard C++ code, um, fork off a bunch of tasks, and they start running on different nodes, and then you can just use standard, you know, POSIX threads, system five, shared memory to coordinate between them. You don't have to use Hadoop or MPI with a you know, specialized API to take advantage of your node. That's the, you know, the, the dream of a uh, single system image. The uh, disadvantages, uh, well, maybe it's just, it's, just, it's just harder to do, which is, you know, you, have, you typically have to end up modifying your operating system to do it. Uh, Hadoop, you don't have to modify your operating system. All you have to do is install Java. You have to have TCP IP connections between your computers. If you can do that, if you have TCP IP and Java, you can do Hadoop. You know, you want to do system, single system image, um, you're, you're talking some kind of, of, of kernel level programming. And node failures, it's more difficult to handle node failures. In Hadoop, something fails, you just move its map or reduce job to a different node. Um, here, you know, node fails, it might, you know, it's like, you know, you know, one of your processor cores just stopped working, you know, it could potentially, you know, crash the whole system. You don't expect processors to just fail. Yes, ma'am? But nowadays they are designing systems where they are prepared. If one node fails, the system still continues to work. So there's like a backup or uh, it most certainly can be done, no question. It's more difficult. It is more difficult in a single system environment because as a single, you, you expect a single system, you expect the whole thing to just work. You know, you don't ex I don't expect, I don't design my code so that one of my processor cores on this laptop might fail. That's just not something I, I really have to, to deal with. Um, you know, how, 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 do you, how do you, you know, on, on if you're, you're spanning, you know, if you have a thousand computers in a data center, it's much more likely that one of them might fail, and you have to design that into the system. And if you're trying to make it transparent to the end user, and you're trying to use all standard tools, it's just a lot more difficult to do that than something like Hadoop with its map reduce. You know, if, you, if you're more restricted, if you just use that map reduce um, concept of Hadoop built into that is the ability that if one of the map jobs fails, you can just rerun it on a different host. You don't have to worry about, you know, recovery any more than just, just run it again on a different host. Okay? So here's a kind of partial history of what's been done with uh, single system images, at least on a POSIX Unix-like system. Um, MOSIX is still around. It's been uh, developed in Israel since 1977, and you can download it. It is closed source, but um, you, know, you download it and you get a bunch of executables. I probably should play with it. I never have, uh, probably because it's closed source, but you know, you can download, you know, download it. And I mean, they've been developing this thing since the 70s. I mean, it's, it was initially wasn't on Linux back in the 70s. I forget what it was. I, yeah, I forgot. I mean, it's gone through a number of revisions, but there's still, you know, you, you have a, a, a single system image environment that works on Linux. You download it and, and you start a, a cluster. Um, it is closed source. Back when it was free, they went to a closed source model in you know, 2001. 
and at that point the people who wanted it open source forked it away. That ran for you know, a couple of years, and then they terminated the project in 2008. Um, this one, Caringd, was developed, uh, you know, French Institute was developed on that. Uh, development there seems to have ceased around 2010. Open SSI is something that um, SEO was doing when they had Unix, I forget, SEO Unix, I think it was. And then um, somehow got transferred to Compaq, and Compaq got bought by HP. You know, they continued working on this for a while, but its uh, last development release was 2010. So it seems to be about 10 years ago, a lot of the, the open source projects that were working in this direction you know, terminated. And there's still the only major uh, continuing project that I'm aware of other than scale and P and herd is uh, Mossix that's uh, closed source but still going. Scale MP is an interesting uh, product. It's a patented proprietary architecture that um, is, uh, is based on the idea of virtualization. In a typical virtual machine, you have uh, multiple virtual machines running on a single physical machine. ScaleMP's idea is to take multiple physical machines and tie them together into one virtual machine. So you have a virtual machine that spans multiple physical machines, and then using the same techniques of virtualization that we use to you know, present virtual machines, present a virtual cluster. It, what it looks like is you know, a, basically a single computer with just highly non-uniform memory. You know, different cores in this virtual computer just um, you know, don't have, I mean they, have, they share the memory but it's, it's localized. E each core has its own localized memory. Um, it's, uh, as I said, it's, it, it's not only proprietary, it's patented um, and it uses InfiniBand for its interconnect. It doesn't run on Ethernet. That's, I mean I downloaded and I have looked at it a bit but I can't run it because it doesn't run on Ethernet. It runs on InfiniBand, which is the, I don't know, it seems like in the high performance environment, the big clusters that uh, InfiniBand is preferred over Ethernet. But uh, you know, what ScaleMP is doing, at least right now, is they're targeting you know, the, you know, the high performance uh, networking interconnect, and they haven't released a version that runs on Ethernet. So it's not something that I can even you know, play with unless they decide to, you know, come up with a version that uh, does. And then, of course, you know, what I've been working on is uh, Mock and Herd. Uh, Mock was developed at Carnegie Mellon back uh, about 25 or 30 years ago. It pioneered the microkernel concept. Mock was really the first microkernel, the idea that we're going to make a kernel that is as minimalist as possible. It does tasks, threads, uh, some kind of inter-process communication mechanism, it does memory management. And everything else is in user space. The device drivers, the file system, the networking, all of that is in user space. All the kernel does is it provides a way to separate the tasks apart from each other, some kind of communication mechanism between them, and then it has to handle the, the virtual memory um, to just to be able to keep the processes separate from each other. And it was specifically designed for a multi-node cluster. Herd um, runs on top of Mock. The idea of Mock is it gives you the tools that you can build a full opera. It doesn't have a file system, for example. But it gives you the tools you need in a kernel. You can build a file system on top of it. So what the Free Software Foundation started doing back in the 90s was they were going to build, you know, a full Unix compatible POSIX free software system on top of Mock. Um, Linux ultimately raced ahead, you know, for reasons, I don't know, I don't even know if I want to speculate about why Linux beat Herd. I think there's some technical reasons, there's some non-technical reasons, but uh, Bottom line is, you know, Linux, you know, became the dominant open source operating system, 
but the free software foundation's you know concept back around 1990 was that we're going to build it on top of mock and it's still around it averages about two releases per year and it's available as part of the uh, debian archive so how viable is it as an operating system this is a diagram of how the how, how, what percentage of the Debian packages actually build on any particular architecture. The green line is heard. You know, Intel is up at the top there. But you can say there's uh, up and down, but the general you know, trend over the past uh, 15 years of you know, increasing support for herd, and now we're about 75%. About 75% of all the packages in the Debian archive build on herd. So, you know, we have a windowing system, we have networking. I wouldn't, it, it's, it's still not production ready. You know, maybe by the end of the lecture it'll be obvious some of the problems that it's got that mean it's not production ready, but certainly, um, you know, you can, you can run an opera, you know, you can log into it, you can, you know, do, you know, windows and, uh, you know, web browsing and compiling and debugging and stuff like that on it. What's the yellow one? The yellow one. I don't know. What is the yellow one? K FreeBSD. FreeBSD I386. I'm not sure what K FreeBSD is. No, it's some FreeBSD variant, I guess. And the one on top, is it? Is Boy. Well, AMD64. Mm -hmm. All these are kind of clustered together. Yeah, there's several colors up there, blue and uh, yeah, <laughs> ARM. You know, you know, a lot of stuff running. You know, the, obviously the, the Intel architecture, the ARM, the uh, 386 architecture. I mean, those are the ones that are dominant. Those are the ones that you know most all the packages build on. But uh, you know, her we got about 75 percent coverage right now, for better or for worse. Is there a reason for that peculiar kind of form? Some of these seem to drip down quite literally. It's sort of artistic, but does it reflect something? What does it mean? I don't know. It looks like it. It would seem like at those points for some some maybe something broke. You, know, you sampled a point for some reason something had broken, a whole lot of stuff was failing. And then they fixed it and it immediately spiked back up again. That was my guess. But uh, I, I I don't know. I haven't looked into the details of you know why this this graph Behaves Where did the graph like that. come from? Debian. It came off their uh, website. I don't have the. Uh, and that's a company that markets Linux, right? It's a. Well, it's not a company. It's um, a, I don't know. Yeah, it's not a company. It, it's it's a, it's a dot org. An entity. Then. Yeah, it's an entity. There you go. An entity. But they developed their own flavor of Linux and, and market. It. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm it's sorry. I. I, I guess I just assume that you knew it. You know, Debian was. I've heard of it. I, I, okay, it's a it's a distribution. It's a, it's a whole bunch of packages that um, you know you can download. You have a package manager, so you can you can pick whatever packages you want out of the archive. It's a package archive, is what it is, and it has multiple uh, architectures that it runs on, mostly Linux. It's mostly Linux, and yeah, in a lot of ways, it is a Linux distribution. And some of the Linux distributions, like Ubuntu, are built using it essentially. You know, it's a pack. It, it's a it's an archive of packages, and uh, I think, yeah, you can just use it as a Linux distribution. And then some of the Linux distributions you know, base themselves on top of it. So it's a, for me, it's a. It, I mean, first of all, um, Herd is one of its architectures. So uh, the easiest way to install Herd is to install the Debian distribution of Herd. If you wanted to run Herd, the simplest way to do it is download it from the Debian website. And for my purposes, uh, what percentage of its archive can actually build on herd is a usable statistic of, you know, how robust herd is at this point. Um, uh, FSF, uh, it, it has its own version of herd that uh, you can get to them? Yes. Um, there are slight differences. Um, not much, but Mainly, um, there's patches that have been done on the Debian version, just whatever, to support stuff in Debian. There, there's, 
there's Pat, there's, there's, there's a slightly Debianized version of Herd. So yeah, the Debian version is a little bit different from the one you get from S FSF, but not much. It's all the same people that are running both packages, but yeah. I assumed that Debian was an ancient druid poet. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe it's named after Debbie. <laughs> Debbie Ann. Okay, so um, mock. How does it work? How does uh, Let's see, when do we want to take our call for break? What, what time do we usually break? Around an hour or later. Okay. Well, what I'm about to do is now I'm about to go into a description of how mock works and then, uh, you know, and then talk about, you know, the work that I'm doing to extend it. So this might be a good chance to break. Okay. How late do you want to go? 6.30 is what we usually do. Fine. So five, five minutes, ten minutes? What do you want to do? Forty-five minutes. We got, it's quarter hour. Okay. Um, when do we want to come back right now? Five or ten minutes. Okay, five or ten minutes, and then we'll start. Should say five or ten, but pick, pick one. I don't know. Whenever everyone's okay, we, it's a small group. Whenever everyone's back. All right. So, um, how does mock work? And then how does how does herd work? Um, this is a diagram of mock's inner process communications mechanism. Um, each task in mock has an array of, of as, as ports. They're like file descriptors in Linux. Um, a port, uh, you can have either a send write or a receive write. You know, the port is a, it's a queue. It's a queue of messages. It's just like, it's like datagram oriented delivery. You can just take a, a message and um, transmit it to a port and it goes into a queue and then it gets received by another task. Um, you can have multiple send writes, but you can only have one receive write. Only one task is going to be receiving from each queue at a given time. Um, you can never have the same queue never has the same name uh, to a task. The same queue can never have two different names at a given task. So if like a task has both a send write and a receive write, like this one does, um, it ha it's the same port number. The, ta the task can tell that this, this send write here is the same as this receive write, and that turns out to be an important feature of mock because you can pass these send writes around. You know, the messages can include, there we go again. Where are we going? Okay, the messages themselves can include uh, send writes and receive writes. You can pass writes around. You know, how, how do you build this graph to begin with? Well, you're, you're, you're passing writes back and forth between the tasks. Um, if you pass a write around between a bunch of tasks and it comes back to you, you can tell that that's happened because it comes back on the same name. Um, and you can tell from this, this diagram, I try to make it complicated enough to get you know, in a sense that you, know, that you can have, you have this you know, kind of complicated inner networking of ports, but it's actually not that difficult for the kernel to keep track of it. I mean, it just has, you know, a bunch of these queues, and then, you know, each one of these ports here is just a pointer to a particular queue. And these can't be forged. Um, you, you, a task cannot transmit to, like, this task cannot transmit to this queue. I mean, if, it, if the kernel enforces this, if, it, if one of these ports is not connected to this queue, there's no way this task can transmit to this queue. So this is also a protection mechanism as well. It's all the all the um, protection in uh, mock is basically, you know, do you have, you know, access to a particular queue? Uh, for example, each task has a task port that is managed by the kernel. Um, you can read anything in its process, you know, anything in its memory space, you can control its ports, you can control its threads. You know, if you have a send write to a task's task port, you can pretty much do anything to it. You control that task. If you don't have a send write to a task, then you can't control it and you can't forge it either. So the protection mechanism in mock is heavily tied to these, you know, unforgeable ports. Michael. What do you mean by control? 
Um, I, if I have send, okay. Um, mostly it's an RPC based mechanism. Mostly these messages are, are command messages. I send some kind of command, I get a reply back, usually. Okay, so if I have a send write to a task, task port, I can send a message that says stop authorize, just stop this task. I can just stop the task. I can send a message that says read 100 bytes from memory address 16,000 and pass them back to me. I can, I, I can read its memory, I can write its memory, I, I can query its port space, I can send a message to it and send me a list of all the ports that this task has. You know, I can control, the debugger uses it. How do you debug a task in mock? You connect to its task port. You do things like stopping all of its threads, looking to see what their addresses are, querying its memory. That's how the debugger works. It's all you know done by. That's how you control things in mock. It's all done with message passing. What does the loop signify down in the bottom there? Which one? The bottom. This one? No, right there. The loop. Yeah. This one. Just above it. Yeah. I'm sorry. This. One. No, no. That's it. This one here. Uh, the idea. This task has both a send and a receive right on this queue. It can both send things to it, oh, I see. and it can receive things to it. It's not, it can't, when you come out of the queue, you go both ways. No, when you come out of the queue, you only go this way. Well, I ha you have this line going back. No, you come out of the queue, <laughs> and you go to that. Oh, I see, okay, you, uh -huh. I see, so I see, okay. No, no, the idea here is that this task is transmitting to okay, here. No, no, the queue does not, you know, send okay. messages to itself oh, in a loop. Right. No, no, okay. So uh, it yeah. should be, the line should be horizontal or? I'm not sure how I should draw that. I want to illustrate that the task, you can have both a send write and a receive write yeah. to a queue. Okay. okay. Usually, I mean, typically the way it works is uh, send writes are associated with privilege. That if I have the right to, you I mean, what the receive write is, when it receives messages off the queue, it's executing instructions. Okay? So if I have a send write to that queue, that means I have the authority to issue those instructions. So typically send write, you, you give something a send write, you're typically giving it privilege of some kind. Okay. They have, you know, numbers like, you know, 27, 18, 52, you know, rel they're, like, they're like file descriptors in Unix, relatively, you know, small numbers. Um, they're different, like this, uh, here, here, for, for this particular, I left the Q out, but uh, port 27 here corresponds to port 52 here. They're, they're, they're separate addresses, there's sep separate port spaces between the tasks. This one sends to 27, and here it receives in 52, maybe. This one might be called 18. You can, ha you know, okay, how do you create this, this network of, uh, of ports? Okay, so the messages are typed. I mean, you, one of the types is just blank data. You, just, you can just send some data through. But the kernel does recognize certain types within the messages. Um, basically, it's just an array, and there's you know a, a, um, a value that indicates what is the type of the message. Okay, so you can have a message with a send write. So let's say this task has uh, a connection from port 27 to port 52, and this task also has another port called 41. Okay, this task can create a send write to pat port 41, put it in the message, and then the message gets transmitted through to task two. The kernel sees the send write, creates a connection, uh, creates a new port over here on task two, let's say it's port nine, and then when the message is received, the kernel has actually changed the number in the message. So when this task receives the message, now it sees send write to nine, and whenever now it transmits something to nine, it's gonna get received over here on 41. You can also do the same thing with the receive write. Notice here, this was, it was transmitting to nine, and receiving a 41. If I relay a receive write to 41, now the error goes the other direction. Now with a receive write, task two has the ability to receive information on this port. So you can transfer send writes, 
you can transfer receive rights. You can do memory transfers as well. You can have a block of memory. You can attach it to a message by putting its address, you know, there's a particular type for this, address length. And then when you transmit the message through, the memory gets transferred from your address space to the other task's address space. This is the basis for Mock's memory management, the ability to attach memory to messages. And I'll explain later just, you know, yeah, I'll explain that in more detail later. But that's the, the basic inner process communication that you have with Mock. Herd, built on top of Mock. The Herd file system, um, Mock has no concept of the file system. You know, Mock just, you know, messages going back and forth between, you know, ports. Something like a file system, that's going to be implemented on top of it using user space stuff in Herd. In Herd, I mean, it's got a, basically a Unix file system. And in the herd file system, every name in the file system corresponds to a port, a send write. You know, if I uh, go you know, bin bash, bash corresponds to a send write to some port, typically on the file server. So um, everything in the herd file system, it's, it's a naming structure for ports. You're, you know, how do I get these port you know, send writes in mock? You know, the herd answer is, that's what the file system is for. The file system is a naming structure for ports. Everything in the, in the herd file system corresponds fundamentally to send writes to ports. Mostly a file server. You know, and the file server has a whole bunch of different ports. I mean, a file server will typically have, you know, thousands of ports open. Ports are relatively cheap in the mock model. Um, and then it can tell the difference between the different files because all the ports have you know, different port numbers. But, for example, you have an HTTP um, directory, if you will, translator is the technical term in herd. It doesn't go to the file server. It goes to a separate server that implements an HTTP file system. So whenever you query something, you know, look for a, a path in this slash HTTP, uh, actually it goes and it does an HTTP connection and retrieves, you know, a web page or something. That's what this thing does. Um, there's a special directory on herd servers um, where a lot of the system servers listen. So servers socket inet is a send write to what's called pfinet. This is our TCP IP stack. Again, all in user space. So how do we do networking operations in herd? Uh, a lot of this is written in the C library. You know, you don't see it. It's just you, know, you do a socket, a connect. What the C library does in herd, if you want to do a socket, it goes up and looks server socket inet in the file system. That gets it a send write to pf inet. And now it's got what it needs to start talking to the TCP IP stack and tell it, you know, with some, you know, uh, remote procedure calls. Yeah, I, I want to go and open a TCP session, for example. That's how they, that's how services and clients coordinate amongst themselves and herd. So here's an example, um, an RPC trace of LS. I just typed LS and hit enter. Um, RPC trace is the herd equivalent of S trace. It traces, an S trace in Linux traces your system calls. In uh, herd, it's called RPC trace. You're tracing remote procedure calls. So how does you know like 144 RPCs for this LS? But here's the you know some of the, the key ones, nine of them. First of all, there's a bootstrap process. Get special port. How do you get a port you know to begin with? Well, there's an initial port you get at your bootstrap port, and that's what this is. Port 143. So we send a message to port 143, um, exec startup get info. There's um, something like 600 some. I think the uh, mock kernel understands 180 messages. And then the total herd system's got about 600 some messages. So probably like another 400. The kernel understands 180 and there's like another 400 messages. These are just identified by 16-bit numbers. So there's like another 400 types of messages that the, uh, 
the user space servers. Like this is a user space message. The kernel doesn't know anything about this. This is just um, the task talking to either its parent or the process server saying, you know, start up get info and it gives it a bunch of stuff. The name of the process, the um, environment variable. This is, these are file descriptors. These are ports, but they are the file descriptors. Zero, one, two, and I'm not sure why you have a third one. Uh, this is, the, these, this set down here, these are these standard port assignments. A port for the current working directory, a port for the current root directory, a port for the auth server, a port for the proc server. So you send this startup get info message, you get a response back, it's got a bunch of ports in it. Now what can you do with them? Well, 148 is this one. This is current working directory. 148, I send a message to 148, dir look up. I'm actually looking up myself. And I get a message back, one says, uh, send write to port 166. These are all writes going to the file server. Tell 166, dir read directory, I get uh, C structure. It's, it doesn't look like a bunch of gibberish, but I get just data back. It's the C structure with the uh, directory information in it. Then it's an LS. I want to print out the information. So 138 came from this terminal open controlling teletype. 145 was file descriptor 1. That it's the first file descriptor. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly. You know, controlling terminals you know, you hit control C on a terminal, it, it doesn't, you don't just read a control C, it actually sends an interrupt message. So controlling terminals are a little special. Um, to measure exactly why you have an open CTY in this thing, but you, it's because, you know, controlling terminals are special, control C, control Z, these don't just send ordinary characters through. But we did on 145, file descriptor one, standard out, we did an open CTY, I got 138, which is a send write, and then 138, we did an IO write, giving it the list of stuff that we want printed out to standard out, and then finally terminated. This is a typical, you know, mock, you know, you, you, you get these send writes to start up with, you send messages through them, you get messages back, that's how you pretty much do all of your operations in mock, heard. Here's an example. How do you um, how do you do memory management in mock? Mapping the C library. Um, 149 was <coughs> the second one here, current root directory. So we sent a directory look up to the current root directory, looking up the the standard system library, libc shared. We got 155 back. Um, we read the beginning of it to look at its ELF header, and then we sent an IO map message, and we got a 153, a send write back to 153, and then we passed 153 to the kernel, the task port, and a VM map call. It's basically telling it, map this thing into my address space. Now, how does this work? I have the file system server here, we got the program here. Program gets port 153 back from the file system server, passes it to the kernel in a VM map. The kernel now is going to use port 153 to speak a memory management protocol to the file system. It's going to start with an init and ready exchange, and then when this process tries to touch something in this address space, try to read something from there, it's actually initially going to trigger a, a page fault because this is empty. The kernel, when it's page fault, is going to send a data request to the file server. It's going to get a data supply back, and then it's going to map that into the process's address space. The reason the kernel is doing this is because you could have the same you know, memory object mapped into different tasks. There'll just be a single copy of it in the kernel and it will map multiple copies to different tasks. Uh, one of the really nice, it's, it's a little complicated, one of the really nice things about it is this is how mock is built to support distributed shared memory. So we have a memory object server that implement, it's just 
a user space program that implements this, this memory object protocol. All of these, let's assume all of these things, all these tasks have mapped this memory object into their address space with a VM map call and they pass it a send write to this memory object server. This task tries to read from that memory space. That causes its kernel to send a data request to the object server. The object server sends a data supply message back that provides the data to that task. Um, other tasks can request it. Other hand, this kernel can just hand out more copies of it here. If this task on a different uh, node, a different kernel, also requests read access, it'll send a data request. The memory object server sends a data supply. That's fine if it's all read-only access. Well, what if one of the tasks tries to write into this address space? Now, what Linux would do is you just flip a bit in your, you know, your map and you allow this task write access. Mock doesn't do that. Mock, before allowing the task write access, will send an unlock message to the memory object server. The memory object server is given the ability to, um, to regulate the kernel's use of the, uh, the, the, the memory space. Essentially, uh, RAM in the mock model is seen as a cache for these memory object servers. The, the memory on the computer is like a front cache for the memory object server. The memory object servers would really is controlling the memory. So the kernel will see or attempt for write access. It will send an unlock message to the memory object server. The memory object server then tell, it says it can't give write access to this task as long as these other tasks have access because then this copy of the memory could get out of sync with this copy of the memory. So what it will do first is it will tell this kernel to flush its copy of the memory. Once that's been done, it gets a lot completed memory, a lot completed message back. Then the memory object server responds to this one telling it, you know, lock request granting write access to this task. If then this task comes and it tries to write it, it'll send a data request to the memory object server. Memory object server will send a flush request to this one. Once this one has returned the data back to the server, then it will hand it out to this one. So this is the kind of stuff that you'd have to patch Linux in order to get it to do, to uh, mediate between, you know, multiple computers all trying to access the same piece of memory. Mock, it's got this, this memory object protocol that was designed into the system 25, 30 years ago. It's the most innovative aspect of Mock, and really we still haven't fully exploited it. I mean, we got the tools available to build a distributed shared memory system, and for the most part, we haven't done it. I mean, we haven't, we haven't done it with Mock. We haven't really exploited uh, this feature of Mock. But it's certainly something you need to do if you want a single system image cluster operating system. All of these tasks have mapped, they, they have you know, distributed shared memory. It all looks like they have a copy of the memory, and then all this stuff, this kernel memory object protocol, is all happening in the background to regulate access to that memory and present those tasks with the illusion that they all have shared memory even though they're on different computers, which is kind of a neat trick. Okay, so it would seem that um, when you like, kind of think about this and process this, it seems like now uh, the only thing we need to do to build a cluster operating system is to take these messages and transport them across the network. It's traditionally called a net message server. Um, all of the interprocess communication in mock happens with these messages. All of the memory management is done with these messages. So it's like, well, if we can just transfer the messages across the network, then we should have a cluster operating system. Maybe. 
you know, this is what I start. I, 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 there have been a number of uh, versions of NetMessage. I mean, they developed the NetMessage server, you know, 25 years ago at you know, CMU. Um, but we don't have one for HERD, so a year and a half ago, um, I, I wrote one of these things, probably like the third or fourth version of NetMessage. But, yeah, I talked about this in the mailing list, and they said the old ones are just, you know, haven't been touched in years, no, no point in trying to port them, just write a new one. So that's what I did. I wrote um, a NetMessage server. So how does it work? All the mock messages are serialized over a single TCP session. We transmit the mock messages almost unchanged. If there's a memory region being transferred, we just tack it on the end of the message. And then we have both local and remote port numbers. There we have two net message servers talking to each other. Local port numbers are transmitted unchanged. Remote port numbers just invert all of their bits. That's how you can tell the difference between a local port and a remote port, is whether all of its bits have been flipped. So it reduces our uh, port space from 32 bits to 31 bits, but um, ha that hasn't been a problem. You, know, you have to hit, what, 32 billion, I'm sorry, 2 billion ports before you run out of you know, 31 bits of port space. And that just hasn't been a problem. So I mean, we cut our port space down from 32 bits to 31 bits. Half of them are local, half of them are remote, and uh, that's how you just uh, send these yeah. messages around. So here, for example, is we have two nodes. We have task, net message server, net message server on the remote node, another task. And let's say we have a, a port, you know, a communication port that's going through the network between these two tasks. Ordinary messages, we just transmit them through, that's no problem. But what if we're trying to transfer a send write? So we have a send write to one of these port queues, and we're trying to send it. So first of all, the task transmits it to the local net message server. Now the net message server has a send write to this port. It transmits the message through, but there's no way it can transmit the send write through. The send write is you know, inside the mock kernel. It's a you know, pointer in the mock kernel to one of these queues. So this program on this node has a send write. It just got the send write. It transmits the message through, but it can't really you know, send the send write. But that's okay, because what this machine does when it receives it is it creates a new queue over here. It's got both a receive write and a send write to it. Puts the send write to this queue in the message and sends the message along. And now, I mean, initially, we're this task was transmitting a message with a send write to this queue. And now this task has received a message with a send write, but to this queue. And when we're done, this is the picture we've got. So now someone tries to send a message to this send write. It goes to this queue, gets received by this net message server, which transmits it through the network to this one, and it's got a send write to this queue here. Well, that was the semantics that we wanted. We were trying to send a send write through to the other port and whenever you do that what happens is you just get a pair of receive send writes uh, in your net message servers and uh, it works pretty well actually. Let me do it for time. I'm going to flip through the last few of these. This is uh, just some of the, the sample code. This is the, uh, the send transmission translation of the send write for transmission. You just have to there's two different branches of the code, one for uh, local ports and one for remote ports. And this is the translation of the send write on reception. So I wrote this thing in about a month, um, fired it up, and uh, found that it, uh, you know, you, could, you had a, a basic remote file system. You could see the files on the other side, but you couldn't execute anything. And the reason you couldn't execute anything was that uh, that distributed shared memory uh, protocol. When Michael Bushnell, now he changed his name, Thomas Bushnell, uh, wrote this back in the 1990s, uh, rather than try and implement all the, the, the stuff for that uh, distributed shared memory protocol, he put that in a library and implemented the code for a single client. And that, it was a great decision. 
I, I think, um, because it allowed them to get the thing up and running. But the problem is it could only handle a single client. So as soon as you've got two computers talking to each other and you're trying to execute a remote program, you need to you know, map that program into your memory space, map uh, shared, um, you know, sh shared library into your memory space, uh, yeah, that's all the memory object protocol. And because you got two computers talking to each other right now, you got two kernels, you need two clients, and the way Michael's code was structured is you only have one client. The first client comes in, that's fine. A second one comes in, it just gets dropped. Makes the code a lot simpler, but doesn't let us execute programs. So worked on some other stuff, mostly math, for six months or so. And then uh, about all, last August, I said, all right, I mean, what's the obvious next step here is we need a multi-client, you know, pager library. So that's what I've been working on for the last six months. Um, this is a sample of the, the, the complexity of the code. This is the, the pseudocode for <coughs> a data request. Um, the probably the, the 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 whole thing is probably about five pages. I mean, the, the core of the pseudocode is about five pages of this level of complexity. You know, you have to look at what if it's terminating. There's error handling. If the page is paging out, and you know, if you're writing it out to disk, um, you have to you know add the requesting client to the wait list. Uh, but there's actually a special case that the wait list is empty. If nothing is waiting, if you're just writing out to disk, then you have to actually um, start flushing the things that are on the access list because you're about to put something on the wait list. Then it's possible the client's on the access list, but it just threw the page away. It can do that. The kernel can just proactively throw pages away and then re-request access. So you've got to handle that case. Um, if, now at this point, if the wait list is not empty, we just, if, if something else is waiting for access to this page, then we're already doing the whole flushing process. We just add this client to the wait list and return. Uh, we got to this point now, we know that, you know, the wait list is empty. So we have a, a client requesting access and there's nothing else waiting. So we have to start into our flush process. If another client has write access, we add ourselves to the wait list, send a flush request to the client that has write access and return, wait for that to finish. If write access is requested and the access list is not empty, then, uh, let's see, if write access is requested and it's not empty, this seems to be the same thing, kind of. Um, otherwise, if the access list is empty and read access requested only read clients you can do that you can give out multiple copies of it with read access um, we have to you know get a copy of it now we uh, that could take a while reading it from the disk so we you know what we actually do is we add ourselves to the wait list unlock read the page relock and then service the wait list there might have been more stuff added to the wait list while this was happening so that just gives you a sense of the, you know, the complexity of this code. Um, I've got some more examples of, you know, just kind of what I've had to deal with with this code, but it's just about 6.30. It was probably a good time to wrap up. Uh, just flip through you know, some more pages of, you know, some of the difficulty with this code, some of the problems we've had with, um, this is a, a bug in our threading code. Uh, bugs with, you know, you know, just some of the bugs I've had, how you, uh, this is the, just the, the thread synchronization code, and uh, summarize of, you know, where we're at in terms of this project, finish the multi-client live pager, get our file system to the point where it can handle multiple kernels as its clients, and then we can, you know, run programs between two nodes with sh distributed shared memory. That's going to be nice, and we're real close to doing that. I keep thinking that, you know, within another couple of weeks or so, that I'll have all the bugs worked out from this code. That's what the, the pages I just flipped through real quick. Yeah, that, that's, uh, yeah, there, there's some tricky bugs in this, uh, 
this, this distributed shared memory code where you got to do all this thread synchronization and track, you know, which clients have access, which clients are waiting for access, and which ones are flushing, and all this stuff. So uh, probably for like the last two months, I've been thinking like I've almost got this done. I've almost got this done. I've all, well, I think I've almost got this done. So this one is just about, you know, done. And then, well, we have a cluster operating system, don't we? We don't have a 64-bit user space, unfortunately. This is just heard is a 32-bit operating system, which means that our programs can only address four gigabytes of RAM. I mean, this is just a known problem we've got with her. We have to update it to be being part of the 21st century. Um, you know, no one's going to, and, and also multiprocessor support. I mean, it's been done. You know, it, it, we got multi-threading code. We just have to go and you know, detect multiple processors, start them running, do all the uh, synchronization between them. I mean, right now we have a 32-bit single processor operating system. So while we're real close to doing all the distributed shared memory and all that, who's going to use an operating system that can only run one core on your processor and it can only address four gigabytes <coughs> of your RAM? So th these are are, are big items to tick off, you know, get the thing running for, you know, 64-bit so you can address all of your, you know, 96 gig of RAM instead of 4 gig of RAM, multiprocessor support so it can use 12 cores instead of 1 core, you know, then we're starting to talk about really something that's viable maybe even for, you know, production use. The net message server needs to be rewritten. Um, it's got performance issues. Uh, it's also got some, uh, that, that whole uh, clever thing where you just, you know, send the port numbers across and you just flip the bits to indicate remote or local. That's fine for two hosts, but what if you had eight of them all trying to intercommunicate amongst themselves? You could have, what, 28 different TCP sessions. Now, that doesn't really work. You have to do something more sophisticated if you're going to do more than two hosts. That whole, and one of the nice things about HERD is actually we can actually uh, address the, uh, the, the PCI device, you know, we can write this thing. It doesn't have to go through the TCP IP stack. You can talk directly to the hardware. Um, in a, a virtual machine environment, you can just map a new network device to your virtual machine. And actually, Cisco is starting to do that. That Cisco, I put a picture up, up on the screen. Its networking card is capable of presenting itself as anywhere from 1 to 16 different PCI devices which is a nice trick. You, know, you just configure it so it just appears like, okay, now I got three network interfaces instead of two, and that means that the net message server could talk directly to the hardware, and that would uh, also help its performance a lot. Um, this is the website for Herd, and then the stuff that I'm doing with trying to build a cluster operating system based on it. I got my own you know, GitHub repository that uh, that I'm working on with that, and that is a you know, quick snapshot, well, hour and a half crap snapshot, of uh, what I've been trying to do with, uh, you know, putting a cluster operating system on herd. So that's my lecture, and I hope you liked it. Okay. Uh, so you're doing this all yourself, right? There are probably about six active developers in herd right now. I mean, people that are actively contributing to it. I'm um, not doing it all myself, you know, but as far as like the, the multi-client stuff, the net message server, yeah, I'm pretty much doing it all myself. I mean, there, there, there's other guys tend to work on other things, other aspects of herd. Yeah. Paul. Uh, let's see, you didn't mention uh, software like Mathematica, for example, that, that can coordinate uh, clusters. Uh, do you have any actual uh, data on a comparable problem run on multiple clusters to give an idea of the overhead of one versus another? Uh, then there's the, uh, the other big question is uh, one gains a certain amount in execution speed at the cost of uh, much greater difficulty in figuring out the uh, software and creating the software that will then uh, run it. 
So the software will run faster, but it takes much longer to do the software. And if you have to change it, does the software adapt or do you have to redo the software? So those are my questions. Okay, so your first question is basically benchmarking. Mm -hmm. I have a list of benchmarks that I want to run, that I want to do that, but where I'm at right now is I'm just trying to get to do remote program execution. It needs to do the multi-client uh, memory object protocol just to be able to run programs. So right now, I mean, it's just right now I'm just, just getting the last couple of bugs out of the code that lets it run remote programs. So it's just getting to a point where it could even attempt to do a benchmark. I haven't done the benchmarks yet because I haven't gotten the bugs out. Um, as far as the difficulty with you know rewriting code, you know writing code and rewriting code, yeah, that is um, certainly a problem. You know that's how I started this lecture. Was the examples of you know what you had, the hoops you had to jump through, you know with, with changing your code around um, to get it to run even on a single machine well, and then to work in a cluster environment. Uh, Cray has kind of shifted gears over the last 15 years. They do not do, you know, custom, I mean, you know, they, they, they build, as we saw, you know, supercomputers, but they would use Intel processors, they use Linux, and what they've been pushing is something called Chapel. It's a programming language they developed so that you can write your code and, you know, all this <coughs> stuff happens behind the scenes right. and, and, you know, selling a whole new programming language, that's a tough sell, you know. Yeah. We know that C is going to be around 25 years from now no matter what. Who knows what kind of support we'll have for Chapel. But yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a very good question and uh, Cray's been trying to address it by just developing a whole new language. Um, so you can write your code in a language that doesn't require you to do all the stuff that I was showing at the start of the lecture. Okay, anyone else? Uh, how do we get the slides? Um, Can we go to these? I haven't. I've actually, actually, I have. I've got the tech source for this thing up on this GitHub repository. Okay. I don't have the PDF. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll probably put up a link somewhere to the PDF. I'm thinking of Elizabeth. In sure, sure. But um, okay. Thank you. Thank you.